Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Andrew McIntyre, for the warm words of welcome and also the kind invitation to join you here at ANU's College of Asia and the Pacific. I'd also like to um, thank uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps for being here. It's wonderful to see two good friends, Professor Peter Drysdale and Michael Lestrange. Are you a doctor? Are you a professor? Probably all of those things together. But uh, both men uh, have made a huge contribution to, um, to Australia's uh, diplomatic community, to our thinking around foreign affairs and to paving a way for us to go forward. Uh, I had the pleasure of first meeting uh, Professor McIntyre, as he mentioned, through the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue and ever since then I've come to greatly respect his intellect but also his deep commitment to the region and strengthening <coughs> Australia's relationships with the region. And I say to you tonight, Andrew, to you and your colleagues, um, you are playing a vital role in uh, Australia's intellectual conversation with our region, both within our own country as well as directly with our neighbours abroad. And so I think as we are in the Asian century and the many significant challenges and opportunities that that creates, um, there could be no more important endeavour for you and your colleagues to pursue, so thank you very much. Um, as we gather here in the Headley Bull Theatre, it would also be remiss of me not to make mention of this great Australian and internationally renowned scholar. As a student at Oxford in the 1990s, undertaking a MPhil in international relations, I would often hear Headley Bull's name, and indeed his seminal work, The Anarchical Society, was prescribed reading. When first published in 1977, Bull's conception of international order in contemporary society, and in particular the way that, quote, great powers manage their relations with one another in the, in the interests of international order, was truly groundbreaking. It helped us all better understand the dynamics of the Cold War. Today, 35 years on, Bull's work is just as interesting and as relevant as we seek to understand the new global order, where the United States and China are viewed as a new G2, the two largest militaries and economies in the world. Today, I want to talk about the rise of China from an Australian perspective and make two essential points, one economic and one strategic. First, despite the current slowdown, China will continue to grow strongly over the medium and the long term. If Australia is to fully capitalise on the opportunities available, we need deeper personal relationships at the highest political level and we need new bilateral mechanisms in place, such as a free trade agreement. Second, Australia must not fall into the trap of making a false choice between China and the United States, as conflict is not inevitable between these two great powers. As China's overriding priority is economic development and domestic stability, it would be extremely wary of risking a conflict, even with an economically weakened United States. The consequence is that the United States, Australia's strategic guarantor, has good reason, in my view, to consider that it can successfully engage China in a global order based on a balance of power structure. <coughs> First to the economic environment. Chairman Mao may have been the founding father of the People's Republic of China, but it is Deng Xiaoping who has made the country what it is today. His economic reforms, the use of market-related strategies, including the welcoming of foreign investment, domestic competition, and a degree of private property rights, unleash the economy from the most destructive elements of the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward. To get rich is glorious, 
Deng is alleged to have said. Understanding that China needed some distance from the legacy of Mao, who was, in his words, only seven parts good and three parts bad. The result is that the China of today is on a remarkable trajectory of economic growth. Averaging 10% growth year on year, China has increased the size of its economy 20-fold over the last three decades. It has become the second largest economy in the world and in the process lifted 350 million people out of poverty. To keep pace with this rapid industrialisation, thousands of miles of expressways, high-speed rail, hundreds of airports and millions of cars have been built. The country now has more expressways than the European Union combined. We'll, bought, we'll build more than 20,000 new skyscrapers by 2025. Is the biggest single vehicle market in the world producing more than 20 million cars annually for domestic consumption. And by 2020, we'll have more miles of high-speed rail that can be found in the rest of the world put together. China has also become the largest trading partner for nearly all its near neighbours, including Japan, India, South Korea, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, Taiwan, and of course, Australia. Australia's annual two-way trade has grown from $113 million 40 years ago, when we first established diplomatic relations, to $121 billion today, more than a thousand-fold increase. Australian exports to China grew 22% last year, and now comprise 27% of our total exports. To put this number into perspective, when John Howard came to office in 1996, less than 5% of our exports were bound for China. <coughs> Iron ore dominates, making up more than half of total exports to China, but coal, LNG and wool also feature prominently. In each of these commodities, Australia is China's largest supplier. Investment too has been growing rapidly with China. Not including Hong Kong, investment has been more than $13 billion in Australia over the last year, making us their number one destination for foreign direct investment. Austrade records that the compound annual growth rate in Chinese inbound investment into Australia has grown by almost 90% per annum since 2006. In light of these trade and investment numbers, it's no wonder that Jeff Rady, Australia's former ambassador to China, has said, whether we are comfortable with this or not, the reality now is that China will be the dominant economic force in our <coughs> national life. It is true, there are signs that China's economy is slowing down, but this is to be expected given the speed and the scale of the growth that we have seen in the years to date. Europe and America's woes are having their impact, with 55% of China's GDP trade dependent. China's exports to Europe, its single largest market, nearly 20% of total exports, are down 16% year on year. The impact of falling exports has been compounded by an over-reliance on domestic investment as opposed to domestic consumption as a source of, GDP, of China's <coughs> GDP growth. In China, only 35% of GDP is consumption, a figure which will inevitably lift over time. China also has a suboptimal demographic trend, where the average age by 2020 will be 37, compared to just 29 in India. This means that pe more people will be living longer, requiring services and support 
from a relatively smaller number of young people. This poses not just a major economic challenge, but also a social challenge too. But all in all, with annual GDP growth trending well above 7%, and the government having the capacity to either ease interest rates or introduce another stimulus package, China's economy, in the words of The Economist magazine, will, quote, not crash. In fact, in the medium and the long term, I believe China, China will only grow stronger. The process of mass urbanisation still has a long way to run. While 10 million people move to the cities each year, half of the 1.3 billion people in China still live in rural areas. Considering that China has 93 cities with over 5 million people, the mind boggles at the huge industrial capacity that will be created when these cities are both fully populated and infrastructure ready. Just a few weeks ago on a recent trip to China, I visited an industrial park in Shanghai, one of hundreds that are found throughout the country. In this mini city, there was over 45 Fortune 500 enterprises from America, Japan and Europe, employing more than 100,000 people, many of whom live on site and work in various manufacturing industries from computers to passenger vehicles. The size and the scale of this undertaking was something to behold. The point is that hundreds of millions of Chinese are now getting the taste of what it means to have real disposable income and they are hungry to get more. One doesn't have to look far in Beijing, Shanghai or Guangzhou for signs of opulence and wealth and while this can create serious divisions and disparities, it also fuels aspiration among a middle class that has swelled to more than 300 million people. In each case, people are looking for opportunities to work themselves up the income chain. And when one understands that China's GDP per capita is still only 17% of that found in the United States, there is still a lot of room for China's wealth to grow. None of this newfound power and prosperity is any surprise to the Chinese leadership. Rather, it is a return to the dominant position they held before the, quote, century of humiliation between 1839 and 1949, which saw a number of tragic events in Chinese history, including the Opium Wars with Britain, the destruction of the Emperor's Summer Palace, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, and the rape of Nanking. As Kissinger emphatically points out in his book on China, quote, China produced a greater share of total world GDP than any Western society in 18 of the last 20 centuries. I repeat that. China produced a greater share of total world GDP than any Western society in 18 of the last 20 centuries. And in 1820, China produced over 30% of world GDP, an amount exceeding the GDP of Western Europe, Eastern Europe and the United States combined. The question then becomes for Australia. Given where China's economy has come from and where it is projected to go, is the Australian government doing all that it can to capitalise on the opportunities available? I believe that the answer is no, and that the government can do more, much more. Our Prime Minister seems disengaged from the China story. Since assuming the top job, Julia Gillard has spent only 48 hours in the country. Contrast this with the record of German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who last week made her second trip to China in just seven months and has already made a remarkable six visits to China since 2006. 
accompanied by seven cabinet ministers and a large business delegation, <coughs> Merkel's intensive engagement with China is delivering results. Annual two-way trade between China and Germany hit $169 billion last year, an 18.9% increase on the previous year. Germany is responsible for nearly half of all of European exports to China, and on this most recent visit, Merkel and Premier Wen Jiabao inked a $3.5 billion deal for the sale of 50 Airbus planes to China. This deal was on top of 10 other agreements, signed in areas including health services, information technology and environmental matters. Like Australia, Germany is this year celebrating 40 years of diplomatic ties with China. But their special relationship, in inverted commas, with more than 40 different identified channels for dialogue, is more energetic than ours. This was not always the case. In the years 2001 to 2006, John Howard visited China five times as Prime Minister, including travelling with senior business delegations. In his autobiography, he talks of the personal relationship he enjoyed with President Jiang Zemin and the, quote, material contribution it made to bilateral ties, including the $25 billion LNG export deal agreed in 2002. Likewise, Labor Prime Ministers Bob Hawke and Paul Keating both developed good relationships with Beijing, something Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard have failed to do. Hawke has been particularly critical of the current government's, quote, lack of visitation in China. In his words, and I'm quoting Bob Hawke, I think it's fair to say that we had as good a relationship with China as any country did. I doubt if that is the position now. That's a blunt message from one of the Prime Minister's strongest supporters. In the absence of federal leadership on China, state premiers, including Ted Bay, Colin Barnett and Barry O'Farrell, have taken it upon themselves to fill the void. All have led substantial business delegations determined to open doors and win business for their state. With the Prime Minister lagging behind, it had no option but to take the lead. In contrast, Tony Abbott and Julie Bishop, on my side, have both been more engaged. The Leader of the Opposition was recently in China and has stated that in the event he is Prime Minister, his first overseas trip will be to Jakarta, with the second to include Beijing. Bishop has been to China four times in the past 18 months, the most recent of which was to attend the prestigious Bao Forum in Henan, where no govern, govern, Gillard government member attended. Both Abbott and Bishop have proposed greater people-to-people -people links in, between the two countries. Abbott has given his support to the idea of an annual dialogue between business, political, academic and media leaders from the two countries, along the lines of the two decades strong Australian-American leadership dialogue, while Bishop has committed the coalition to a reverse Colombo plan to enable hundreds of young Australians to spend time working and studying in the region. I would add the need for a bipartisan young leaders dialogue at the party and the political level, together with the prestigious scholarship fellowship program, which could be well endowed by business enable our best and brightest to study in China. Initiatives such as these and the kind proposed by Abbott and Bishop will only deepen Australians' understanding and appreciation of the transformation that is actually taking place in China. This will equip us to have what former Ambassador to China, Ross Garneau, terms, and I quote, a productive relationship of the future which sees Australians speak from close understanding of how Chinese see the issues on which we seek influence and of how we ourselves are seen and understood. It must be said that the price Australia pays for a less than fully charged bilateral relationship is that significant opportunities to strengthen ties go unfulfilled. One such opportunity 
is a free trade agreement between the two countries. Negotiations were initiated in 2005 during the term of the Howard government. 18 rounds have passed with no agreement concluded. To put it in perspective, in 2005 New Zealand also began discussions with China over an FTA. It reached an agreement in 2008 and has since seen its exports to China nearly double. But for Australia, as a result of this impasse, we are missing out on an important opportunity to broaden the trading relationship beyond a natural resources focus. Financial services, education, agriculture and infrastructure all offer great prospects for deeper links which could be enhanced through an FTA. Foreign investment will also invariably be on the table. Contrary to the media noise, the Coalition has a clearly articulated policy on foreign investment. We welcome and encourage greater foreign investment for its key to maximising Australia's productive capacity. Our call for more transparency and lower thresholds, particularly in the agricultural sector, should give foreign investors nothing to fear. Rather, it will help debunk some certain myths that are peddled and enable a rational debate based on established facts to determine what is in fact in the national interest. But far more than just an economic agreement, a successful FTA would also be a positive statement of political intent. It would send a, a message to the leadership in China that Australia sees itself as a long-term partner. That is why an FTA is so important. So starting at the top, from the Prime Minister down, we must further develop the relationships and the mechanisms that will see our two countries continue to prosper together. Seeing our Prime Minister hop on a plane to Beijing to break the deadlock on the Australia-China FDA would be a very good start. The second topic I wanted to mention tonight was the strategic environment. Nobody can tell you with certainty how the future will play out. That is why we see in our region so much anxiety with China's rise. China's very presence as a great power is a challenge to the status quo. The Pax Americana that was in place following the end of the Cold War is no more and many of our friends in the region including Japan, India, Singapore and the Philippines to name just a few fear China as a new unchecked hegemon threatening to them. Each of these countries are re-equipping their militaries and inviting increased American engagement with the region as a means of keeping the peace. In the words of former Deputy Secretary of State Bob Zellick, many countries hope China will pursue a peaceful rise, but none will bet their future on it. But do I think this will lead to inevitable conflict in our region and a battle between China and the United States? The answer is no. And I say this for three main reasons. First, China's priority is economic development. A major incursion abroad would take it off track and arguably threaten the very existence of China's one-party rule. The strange happenings, even over the past fortnight, with the unexplained absence of China's leader in waiting, Xi Jinping, gives us a taste of how opaque the power structures really are. China's leadership is all too aware that a lack of continued economic progress is a recipe for domestic instability. Already, there are regular demonstrations from Chinese farmers pushed off the land and a growing band of young people longing for greater political freedoms. Not to mention the internal troubles in Tibet and with the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. 
As long as prosperity reigns, the leadership has a better chance of keeping, keeping these movements in check. This means that China will do everything it feasibly can to fuel its economic machine. Maintaining an artificially pegged currency, flouting intellectual property rules and trading with pariah regimes are all a means to an end. While the West keeps its distance from resource-rich nations like Zimbabwe and Sudan, China does the opposite, rolling out the red carpet for Mugabe in Beijing and sending thousands of its troops to Khartoum to ensure the oil runs free. We might not like this, but this is what China will continue to do. Second, if one looks at China's history as a guide, it is not a proselytising country determined to reshape the natural order. With its 22,000 kilometres of land borders and 14 neighbouring countries, China has achieved its expansion in the past, in the words of Henry Kissinger, quote, by osmosis rather than conquest, or by the conversion to Chinese culture of conquerors who then added their own territories to the Chinese domain. While it has been to war with its neighbours in the 20th century, including Korea in 1950, India in 1962, and Vietnam in 1979, I concur with Bob Zellick, who has argued that China does not, and I quote, seek to spread radical anti-American ideologies, nor does it see itself in a twilight conflict against democracy around the globe, or see itself in a death struggle with capitalism. In other words, in working with the China of today, America does not confront a Soviet Union Mark II. It is not a zero-sum game where one country's gain is the other's loss and therefore it does not require a strategy of containment. The fact that American policy planners are sensitive to and clear about this is reflected in the recent words in Beijing just yesterday of US Defence Secretary Leon Panetta and I quote, our rebalance to the Asia-Pacific region is not an attempt to contain China. It's an attempt to engage China and expand its role in the Pacific. It's about creating a new model in the relationship of two Pacific powers. This formulation is a positive roadmap for the future where both countries can find a way to actively compete for mutual gain without any compulsion of going to war. The third reason I do not believe that China and the United States are heading for inevitable conflict is that from a military perspective, China's capability remains a long way behind that of the United States. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, China may be increasing its military spend by more than 10% each year to around $140 billion. But this is still less than a quarter of the annual military budget of the United States. I understand transparency with China's defence budget is a significant issue, but leaving, even allowing for this factor, the spending gap is still huge. So while China may sometimes threaten and cajole the last thing they need or want is a conflict with the United States. I must say, with one caveat, and that is Taiwan. I believe if Taiwan sought independence, China would put all options on the table. Therefore, given China's relative military strength vis-à-vis -vis the United States, its strategic goals are to modernise its military, and maintain and expand its spheres of influence, including with North Korea, Pakistan, Burma, Laos and Cambodia, and to the extent possible, push its historical territorial claims without risking a conflict with the United States. 
The most immediate example of this is China's activities in the South China Sea. China's decision to establish a legislature to represent the 1,100 people who live on the Spratly, Paracel and Maxfield Bank Islands and to establish a garrison command of PRC troops was a provocative act given the competing claims by Vietnam and the Philippines. China is also in a tense standoff with Japan over the Seneku Dio Islands in the East China Sea, which has seen mass demonstrations outside Japan's embassy in Beijing and the temporary closure of Honda, Canon and Panasonic factories in China. I believe the situation has the potential to spiral out of control and it's a real test for the players involved. Indeed, when I was in China just a few weeks ago, the Japanese Prime Minister, Yoshiko Noda, sent an emissary to Beijing carrying his personal letter to President Hu Jintao in which he called for calm over the territorial dispute. While Australia is not directly involved in these competing claims, we do have a stake in the outcome. It is not about the significant fish stocks and gas reserves each of the parties claim, but about the freedom of navigation for more than one third of the world's ships that pass through these vital sea lanes of communication. Australia, like the United States, would best be served if these sea lanes remain designated as international waters allowing the peaceful trade and commerce. While Australia is right not to try and involve itself in brokering a solution, nor taking sides on particular claims, we do hope that the United States can continue to play a constructive role in calming tensions between the main players and in the process brokering a non-violent settlement based on an agreed code of conduct. This does offer the best possible chance for a peaceful resolution of the competing claims. In fact, these maritime border issues are a timely reminder to all of us of why it is so essential to have the United States deeply engaged in our region. As the world's strongest military, their very presence acts as a deterrent to aggressive behaviour and should they retreat from the region or quote, see primacy as some have called for, other powers would look to quickly fill the void. This would create, in my opinion, a dangerous imbalance. It would see heightened nervousness and a potential unwinding of key strategic alliances. Indeed, should the US retreat from the region, it would lose substantial credibility with other major powers like India and Russia, and important allies like Japan may take it upon themselves to go nuclear in order to safeguard their own strategic position. Not to mention Australia's own standing with China and others would be severely undermined were we seen to be walking away from our ally, encouraging the United States to play a lesser role. Nations are like individuals. They respect consistency and loyalty. I, for one, will not join the chorus of those who are critical of President Obama's speech to the Australian Parliament and the subsequent announcement that US Marines will be rotating through Darwin. Welcoming our troops from our ally is a logical and a necessary consequence of a commitment to the maintenance of peace and stability in the region. For these reasons alone, it would be folly for Australia to want anything but deep American engagement. We should be actually thankful that our steadfast ally, with whom we have shared interests and values, is in the words of President Obama, all in when it comes to the Asia-Pacific region. Ladies and gentlemen, both China and the United States 
will need to display great statesmanship and mutual understanding if they are to harmoniously navigate the period ahead. A man who understands both countries as well as any is Henry Kissinger. And he has said that both China and the United States need, in his words, to take into account the other's nightmares, recognising that their rhetoric, as much as their actual policies, can feed into the other's suspicions. If challenged, Kissinger has said, the United States will need to do what it must to preserve its security, but it should not adopt confrontation as a strategy of choice. This proposition should apply to both countries. Australia has to be careful not to be dragged into making a false choice between the great powers. In my opinion, conflict should be unlikely to occur because in a modern war against one another, both sides can only lose. It is therefore in their mutual interest to cooperate, to maximise their own economic prosperity and security. There is just so much at stake. If the great powers can avoid a tendency to rivalry and instead engage in competition in accordance with healthy norms, Australia becomes a big winner in the China game. In conclusion, in October 2003, the United States President George W. Bush and the President of China, Hu Jintao, addressed the Australian Parliament on successive dates. These events went beyond the symbolic. They were remarkable occasions which illustrated to the world Australia's unique ability to develop deep, simultaneous and distinct relationships with these two most powerful nations. Now, almost a decade on, it is time to reassess. We have been the greatest beneficiary of China's rise, and there is more to come. But we have no room for complacency. We need to urgently accelerate our political engagement at the highest levels and put in place more effective mechanisms like an FTA. And we too, need to avoid the trap of making a false choice between China and the United States. Both are great powers who, in the interest of their own security and prosperity, must get along. The more deeply engaged the United States is, the more stable our region is, and the better we all are, including China. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the challenge we face. The alignment of our economic and our strategic interests as we work with our friend China and our ally the United States to create a peaceful and a prosperous future. If we get it right, we have so much to gain. If we get it wrong, we have so much to lose. And in essence, the China game is today's world game. And Australia is placed better than virtually any other country on earth to play a winning hand. Thank you very much. Pretty good drive, so, uh, Thanks very much, Josh, for the balanced and generally bipartisan view of the relationship with China. Uh, I have two, two questions. Uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning the importance uh, of uh, China's involvement in the global system as the important stabilizing uh, element in dealing with the rise of China. Uh, I'd like to draw you out on that because uh, it seems to me that that's a central interest for Australia. And I ask you really what can Australia do in that context to secure uh, China's responsible stakeholder role as John would call it in the global system. Uh, the second question relates to that. Uh, uh, basically, I heard your prescription for the bilateral relationship as one of increased uh, leadership dialogues of the kind we've had in the past uh, and uh, the resolution of the FDA problem. Sure. Uh, 
I wonder, is there not something more that needs to be done than that? Uh, you know, FDA doesn't really articulate uh, in any uh, grand conceptual way the nature of the relationship, uh, the principles or reference points and relationships we need to have with China and leadership exchanges uh, are not going to do that unless they have a defined purpose or objective. So isn't there something more we need to do in a relationship with China than just more of the same, uh, which is what you seem to be suggesting? Okay. Well, I'll deal with the second one first and say, in politics and in diplomacy, personal relationships matter. And so my point, Peter, was that I don't think we have those personal relationships at the top now that we had when John Howard was there and indeed when Bob Hawke and Paul Keating were there. And I think that's the issue of visitation which Bob Hawke talked about. And I tried to draw a parallel uh, example with, uh, with Germany. Uh, now we're in a great position to be in China and for their leaders to be here on a more frequent basis than it is. And so while we do have dialogues, we can broaden those dialogues out. And that's why I quoted uh, Professor Garno, because he says you actually have to have an intimate understanding of how you're being perceived over there, as well as understanding their perspective. And so I think that face time is really, really important. Taking it at much lower level, you know, talking about the reverse Colombo plan, that's a positive step forward. I think it's fantastic that you know, upwards of 150,000 Chinese students are in Australia every year and that upwards of 350,000 Chinese tourists are visiting Australia every year. This is a wonderful way to, um, to engage. So I would say, it's, I'm not saying more of the same, I'm saying better than, this, than what we currently have, Peter, because I think that those personal relationships can matter. The, second, the first question that you raise about um, the global order and being a responsible stakeholder, well, that's, that's, that's the, but, the, the nub of the issue because for example, we're seeing atrocities in Syria, and uh, you know China, as a member of the Security Council, along with Russia, has been blocking that. I mentioned, you know, I didn't hold back in talking about um, intellectual property or an artificially peak exchange rate, and I totally agree with Wayne Swan when he's come out and he said China should have more of a floating exchange rate. Um, when there are human rights issues, we've got our dialogue uh, where we need to make that vocal and. You know, there have been um, you know, <coughs> issues with the Uyghurs and trying to block people coming to Australia or with um, the Dalai Lama. Look, we have to stand our position on those issues. Uh, and I think the Chinese will respect us. And we have to work in the confines of the international organisations to speak out when we think that China is going down the, right, the wrong path. So I think whether it's on the economic, whether it's on human rights, whether it's on and trade and trade intellectual property the exchange rate. I think there are various there are various mechanisms for us, Peter, to to make it clear to China where we think that they could be doing uh, doing more. Just as by the way, we make it clear to the Americans we don't you know we want them to have a, le a fair level playing field in when it comes to trade or the Europeans too. Here's what I've got. I've got Nico, Justin, up the back. Over here, so I'll try and get into two. Let's take two at a time. Me young and Justin. I think I'm from a private school and uh, economist, but I'd like to raise some questions about uh, the political side of the story. Thank you very much for the, uh, you know, expressing your view in a very articulate way. And, uh, you know, you talk about a personal, a very high level personal relationship. You talk about uh, the mechanism the view in enforcing the bilateral relationship. You also mentioned about the remarks about you know, U.S. Defense Minister recently. You also talk about the remarks from uh, Kissinger. So I see there are certain elements and uh, relating to the issue, rather philosophical. I think the issue is being raised by, uh, by the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. A few months back, he wrote an article. In that article, he mentioned that the future orientation of the Chinese uh, regime somehow is determined or be subject to the attitudes of a Western country towards China now. So how do you think that all these elements actually can be incorporated in this kind of philosophical thinking about uh, influencing? It's not just you know forging and uh, or engaging, 
but also influence the way that uh, the future China regime will change. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for a very effective, sweeping discussion. I'm, I'm uh, an early graduate student here within the college. Um, I've got a lot of questions, but as an undergraduate student would have, um, but I'll limit to one for this point. Um, more, more we can continue to ask. Yeah. More over one. Yeah. Um, you talked about the, uh, well, you mentioned briefly the, the scholarship fellowship yeah. program, um, and you talked also briefly about the Columbia plan. Um, I just wonder if you could provide some more details on that, um, in particular, uh, what sort of numbers you'd be looking at, um, what sort of age groups of students you'd be targeting, um, and if this would be a more broader across Asia program, or if it's just China focus. Well, um, let me deal with these two questions, and I might have to get a clarification. But um, we have, as we get closer to the election, I think we'll put more numbers in terms of what the financial commitment will be to ensure that the reverse Colombo plan is well funded. Um, but it's you know, talking about young people, whether it's undergraduates or whether it's postgraduates, and giving them the opportunity to, to, to study overseas, and it's not confined to China, absolutely not confined to China. That's the official party position. What I was saying today was a, my own personal idea was about a, um, a well-funded, prestigious fellowship program. Because you see all these business leaders in Australia who are saying, let's get closer engaged with China. Well, I'd be saying to them, please put your money down. Right? Let's capitalise on this opportunity. Uh, if you want to get people in Australia, particularly young people, to have a better understanding of what's happening here, what better way to you know, fund an equivalent fellowship? So I, I think um, there's, an there's a window of opportunity to go and tap the private sector to put an endowment in place, which would see, which in that case would be directly China focused. And I don't know what Peter um, Drysdale's uh, committee is going to come up with for their Asian century idea, but I'm sure they're going to have lots of good ideas around greater engagement in this regard. But I just wanted to put that on the table, hoping he'd be in the, influ in the audience. Um, that I, I, and, I, and, I'm, and that's not asking the taxpayer to pay. That's just asking the government to take a lead role, because when the Prime Minister goes and speaks to, a, um, to, to these leading, leading companies and asks for half, and that should be a bipartisan approach, on behalf you know, of the Australian people, let's create this endowment, make it a government policy. That's going to carry a lot more weight than a, um, a dean of the, uh, the the Asia School doing it, unfortunately, to say. So I think this could be a major initiative. I think there's a window, and if you could do it, then you can fund, like the Monash Foundation does. But when I speak to the people at the Monash Foundation, they tell me overwhelmingly the vast number of people are off to Oxford or to American universities or to Cambridge and so forth. They're not actually taking those scholarships and going to Asia. And now, obviously, there's going to be the language challenges and so forth, but... You know, as we know, in our region, we've got some of the great universities, some of the National University of Singapore's up there, you know, um, universities in Japan, University um, of, uh, of Peking and so forth. So I think there are really good opportunities there. Um, on your issue, so just to clarify, it was, you were saying that how do we get the, is it the current leadership to be more modern in their thinking? No, 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 the, the, the uh, attitudes of a Western country is... Yes or incumbent power towards the rising power. Now, yes. we influence the future direction and orientation of the policy and the regime in the future. Our, sorry, the, uh, the, the engagement now, the okay. approach. Yes. Uh, basically, so whether it's a, you believe the zero-sum game or the positive-sum game. Oh, well, I believe and that. And you, and you came, yeah, you came, uh, you, you come with the uh, approach, right? Sure. No, not just your individual, you know. It's a philosophical issue. About, uh, whether the West sees that as a zero-sum game. Yeah. Okay, whether the West sees it as a zero-sum game. Um, I don't think it does. And, you know, I think that's why the Panetta comments were really interesting. By the way, this visit, and I don't know if he's left yet, but he was in Beijing yesterday, this was the first uh, visit that he has made to China in official capacity, but it was also the first time an American Secretary of State, a uh, Defence Secretary, had spoke at the Naval Co or the Army College or the military college. Um, and so what I, see, I read that as being is reaching out. Um, and while I was in, um, in China a couple of weeks ago, Hillary Clinton was coming through um, after her trip here in the Pacific and the Cook Islands and so forth. So 
Um, I, I think the Americans, you know, you've got to understand the context. We've, they've just gone through their most painful experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq. They've got $14 trillion of debt. There is congressional gridlock as to how they're going to pay back some of that debt. And they're talking about cutting $1 trillion out of the defence budget. Now, something's got to give, doesn't it? Something's got to give. Fortunately for us, it seems that they're placing a real emphasis on our region. But I just think the last thing any American government wants is, a, uh, is to see a heightened conflict with China. And they don't want to see that over Taiwan. They don't want to see that over um, disputes in the East China Sea or in the South China Sea. So I, I, I'm much more positive, and I think someone like Henry Kissinger is having a significant impact, even in, in, in his elderly years, because he's written a very, um, a, a very important book. He's published uh, an important piece in Foreign Affairs not that long ago. And nobody doubts Henry Kissinger's credentials as an American patriot. Right? In fact, you know, a lot of people from the left have been critical of Kissinger in the past. But he's a former Secretary of State National Security Advisor who's saying to America, don't look for a fight with China. And can I just say one interesting, um, one interesting footnote here is the US American presidential election. Because I think there has been a difference in the language that Obama has used and that Romney has used. And Romney has said on day one he's going to call China, you know, a, um, call them in viol for violating trade rules and for, uh, for um, artificially peaking their currency. So that's quite a strong you know, position where Obama's been a bit more nuanced. So I think there will be a different tone if there's a Republican administration. But I think the overriding view in Washington is we, don't, we want to stand up. We don't want to be pushed over here. We're not going to allow our interests to be trampled. Or, more importantly, we're not going to allow our allies to be let down. But, you know, we want to keep this at a level well below uh, conflict. Yeah. I'm Brian Mandel. I'm one of these fellows at the old auspices of the Dean of the College of Age of so <laughs> I have to stand up for that now. Um, I'm curious on one point. You, you, I like your point on the need more heartland engagement. And it's interesting that you compare Australia with Germany and Merkel, because Merkel's been criticised strongly in Germany for not going to China enough. In fact, if you compare Merkel's efforts to those of her predecessors, particularly from the coal, he was there, yeah, sure. the man of physics, sure. well, obviously it's a thing. Yeah. Um, I raise this not to sound like a smart alley, but to make the point that everyone wants more engagement with China. Sure. Everyone's trying to do the same thing, and a lot of it is not on our side necessarily, perhaps a willingness to go there, it's a willingness on the Chinese side to have us. To which your comparison on Penance's visit versus Clinton's visit, where Clinton could see Xi Jinping because he heard the back swimming and then he got to speak at party school. How do you think Australia, therefore, can make itself more attractive to China so that we can actually have these visits and what are the mechanisms you see for the next generation as the most effective to do that? Okay. Garen, folks, we're getting time pressure, so I'm going to ask questions to be short and um, okay. answers, answers to be short. Yeah, good question. Yes. So it's a, it's a quick question. Sure. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership yep. between um, the, the US and, and a lot of the countries in the Asia-Pacific, um, what's your stance on, on that one? It's been criticised for being um, somewhat um, isolationist toward, or contain, containment related to China. And I was interested in what you had to say about that. Well, I don't think they've, they've shut the door on China in terms of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think it's a good thing because I think multilateral trade is obviously prefer preferential to bilateral agreements. But the problem is for the Doha round, we've just had you know, nothing for so many years. So I think Australia's been right to pursue bilateral um, FTAs quite successfully. Um, so I support the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good agreement. I mean, don't forget Australia and New Zealand have their ASEAN agreement which is, I think, a significant one. And I think we can thank the Singaporeans who did a lot of good work with us on that and the Indonesians and others. But um, I'm all for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, on your point, I, I, take it, I take one point and I disagree with the other. I, I, I take the point that there has been a tradition in Germany of high-level visits, and that's true with Helmut Kohl. But if you compare Merkel's number of her visits to other European leaders like Cameron in the UK is relatively 
Newer um, or, or others, uh, she has been a standout. Sarkozy and, and, and his predecessors, she has been a standout. And by the way, she did go and see the Dalai Lama a few years ago and got, got in a lot of trouble for that with the Chinese, but she you know, persisted and, and she's been able to sort of make a stance on some issues and, and engage regularly. So I would, I would say to you that she has been um, a, a good role model in some respects in terms of the high-level engagement. But I don't accept that Australia is not going to be invited or welcome over there. And I, I think they have been significant um, high-level Chinese visits here. We'd always want to have more, but the leader-in-waiting, I think, was in Australia in 2010, um, and, and together with the, the Vice Premier leader-in-waiting here at this university. So there we go. And there was a joint announcement with the government at the time on, on principles and so forth. So I think the Chinese would, would love to have us there more regularly on a regular basis. Um, and I think um, we just have to go there with things to say and things to do. And that means that for us to be creative, we're not going there just to wear out the carpet. You know, we're going out there to, to try to lock in some agreements on a range of issues. And, you know, it was said before that the, the FTA is not, you know, not a catch-all. Of course it's not. But it's still a, I still think it's a facilitator of deeper trade ties, broadening trade ties. And as I said in my speech, I think it's a sign of political intent as well. I mean, you know, if you think back to the Australia-US FTA, um, that's a pretty complex deal, very de complex, dealing with agriculture and intellectual property and the pharmaceutical industries and the movie industries and everything else. But at the end of the day, George Bush and John Howard got together and they capitalised on their good relationship and said, we're going to get this done. We're going to get this done. And it got done pretty quickly in that context. And you know, obviously the relationship with China is very different and the, F and the, and the investment issue will be, will be controversial, the agricultural issue will, may be a bit controversial and a few other things, but let's get it done because I think it will bed down a broader relationship. Okay, my question is in the middle and we'll make that the last and we'll keep talking over, over drinks and uh, nipples. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm usually, in, uh, in, uh, I'm working as a management consultant uh, in the public sector. My question is, um, you know, it's good to see you making a point saying, well, we need to, um, as a government, we need to engage in more at the top level to create more opportunities, sure. reaching the channels. Whereas my question is to say, well, as from the business point of view, um, apart from the booming uh, mining boom in the recent years, what are the areas for the business to get ourselves ready, you know, to pursue those um, opportunities, to capitalise those uh, opportunities? Good question. Um, well, firstly, uh, the head of the BCA, uh, Tony Shepherd, um, together with Twiggy Forrest and a few others, made a quite a uh, prominent visit to China. Maybe it was a month ago. Uh, it was reported front page of the Australian, with the sole intention. I think it was and Mike Smith, head of the ANZ, and a few other senior Australian business leaders, with the intention of saying, "Let's start a high level." business dialogue. So let's start a high level business dialogue. Um, and so I think um, that will be very useful. In terms of the areas, well financial services are going to be important. Um, legal services. I noticed my old law firm, Ellison Stephen Jakes, I have to correct the record, I did my articles there, but then I went straight to uh, work in government uh, after I did my articles. I didn't do five years there. But Ellison Stephen Jakes is now merged with King and Wood which doesn't sound like a Chinese firm, but they took a, an, English, an English name, but they are a Chinese firm, the biggest, I think, in China, uh, certainly one of the leading firms in China. Um, and so, you know, that's going to open doors. Monash University has been, I think, the first university, Australian university, to be granted a opportunity to run a campus in, in China. And I've seen in recent days reports of 1,500 graduate students, masters and PhD students going through there. Um, agriculture. I mean, there's going to be lots of opportunities in agriculture. I'm a big believer that we need to export more of our... We export 60% of what we produce today. Um, we're not about to starve in Australia. Um, but in the rest of the world, the growing population and the water stress does mean... And the changing diets. You know, as more people move into the middle class, suddenly their diets change. So it takes seven kilos of grain to make one kilo of meat. 
And so, you know, as people move in the middle class, they move off grain solely to a meat diet. And so we are in a great position. If we hadn't stuffed it up over the live cattle exports to Indonesia, we would be riding the gravy train there. But I think there are opportunities in many other areas with China in financial and legal services, with agriculture and telecommunication. I think Telstra, I think, has a major presence in Hong Kong, but has been held back from getting into the mainland. Now, you know, that's got to be an opportunity as well. So I, I think there, there, there are plenty of opportunities. And can I just say one point? Um, when I talk about higher level of engagement and visitation, I mean, I wrote a speech, you know, uh, a while, uh, you know, a week, a few days ago, certainly, um, and I also published in The Australian. But yesterday, last night, I turned on Late Line, ABC, and I saw footage of Dennis Richardson, the head of the Department of Foreign Affairs, speaking at a conference last night. And his point was, we do need higher level engagement. So here's the government's, you know, top Mandarin in this particular area and soon to be head of defence out there saying we've got to do better with high level engagement with China.